things. First of all, you need to make clear that by providing context about the U.S. military-industrial complex and the history is not excuse what is happening in Ukraine. It is just to provide context in history. Okay. Number two, the wars come and go. The Ukraine proxy war started. It will eventually end. We take it through and do not escalate the nuclear war. So I'm trying to today provide context about why this happened. So I'll go fairly quickly, and then Ryan will speak, and we'll leave time for questions and answers, because I want to uh, make sure if you have any questions about those who profit from war, I'm here, and uh, yeah. Do you want me to? Uh, I can actually address something like this one. Yes, please. Okay, so what is the war industry? The war industry is comprised of the corporations that develop, market, and sell goods and services to the U.S. military, to U.S. intelligence agencies, and to allied capitalist governments around the world. Okay? Incorporated. Next slide. So why, why do we have hundreds of military bases around the world? Why? Why do we deploy, or why does the U.S. ruling class deploy, military intelligence worldwide? Number one is to harm or to threaten governments that try to chart an independent foreign policy. Number two is to ensure the free flow of natural resources out of the global south and into the hands of multinational corporations, many of which are based in the United States or in Western Europe. And number three, because war is profitable. You have an arrangement of many, many corporations, some of the most powerful corporations in the world, they make an enormous amount of profit off of nonstop war. And so this third point is what I'm talking about today. Next slide, please. We need to know who these corporations are. Okay? We need to know them. The big five, which many of you are familiar with, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics. We need to know these. Our neighbors need to know these. Our friends and family need to know these. Okay? These five do most of the military contracts. There is also L3 Harris, which recently uh, was a merger between L3 and Harris Corporation. There's been a lot of mergers and acquisitions. I can get into that if you want later on. And so now it's really the big six. L3 Harris is another huge one that you need to know. So who else? Wait, wait. Uh, Huntington Ingalls, you need to know. It focuses mostly on shipbuilding. There, there are several more that once you get these, that's basically uh, the bulk of the war corporations. Honeywell, Bose Allen Hamilton, you'll recognize Bose Allen Hamilton because that was a corporation that Edward Snowden was working for mm -hmm. at the time that he leaked in the summer of 2013. Lidos, Amentum, which I will get into, SAIC, Khaki, KBR, KBR, you'll remember because it was part of Halliburton back in the early war profiteering in the early um, U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, spring 2003 and beyond. And Textron. Um, many of these, as I alluded to earlier, don't just do military contracting. They do the bulk of the U.S. intelligence workload. So they're in CIA. They're contracting for a defense intelligence agency. They're contracting for National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, um, National Reconnaissance Office, which does all the satellite launches, or contracts, rather, contracts with corporations to do all the satellite launches. Next slide, please. Banks and asset management firms. Financial firms hold and vote the shares of most of the stock in the big war corporations. So this is to say that Wall Street, writ large, profits from war as well. Big banks. War corporations have sales goals, and the executives at these war corporations are structurally bound 
pursue this short-term profit maximization. Quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, yearly profits, and then it, it repeats. Okay, next slide, please. So who are the primary institutional stockholders? Many of them are here in New York City. BlackRock, you've definitely heard of. Uh, another big one, J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, State Street, Vanguard, and Wellington Management is another big one. Okay, State Street and Wellington, I think, are in Boston. Next slide, please. Private equity. Private equity is basically when a few wealthy individuals pool their money, they buy a corporation, they restructure it, Sometimes they blend it with another corporation. And mind you, when they restructure, they usually shed jobs or find another way to profit. So they reduce uh, the workers' pay or they automate further. And then their long-term goal is to eventually sell the corporation that they've acquired and restructured in order to make a profit. Okay? Now, private equity in recent years has gotten into the war industry. They're not a huge part of Warren Street. I mentioned Amentum earlier. Amentum didn't exist uh, until 2020 or 2021. What happened was a private equity firm called Lindsey Goldberg purchased a portion of a large um, construction firm, project management firm called AECOM, AECOM. And AECOM had been doing military contracting for a while. So Lindsey Goldberg, a private equity firm, purchased a portion of AECOM, then purchased DynCorp, which should be familiar to many of you because it was profiting in Iraq and Afghanistan, and blended it, blended those two together to make a large war corporation. And then they recently purchased a corporation called PAE, which did military contracting, intelligence contracting, and so now they have this firm called Amentum, which is now a top 10 war corporation. It didn't exist before 2020, 2021. And this corporation is in private hands, and it's all in the business of war. Think about, and this is not to impugn this particular corporation, just war corporations in general. Think of the slimiest, dirtiest business person you can think of. Now imagine that that person's business is war. Now take that one person and multiply it by a few thousand, and that's what we have. These are a few thousand corporate executives, in the, largely in the United States, who are profiting from war, and we'll get into how they keep that game going. Next slide, please. Private equity examples. Okay, uh, wait. Uh, at the bottom here, Regent Equity Partners owns Sightline Media Group. So a private equity firm owns Sightline Media Group, which publishes many of the military news-oriented publications. So that's one way to control the narrative, is if you acquire a media corporation, and that media corporation talks about war, it's not going to talk about, for example, those who profit from war or the underlying structural implications of that. So the other day, for example, there's Defense News, which is owned by Sightline Media Group, which is owned by Private Equity. I was reading Defense News the other day. It's important to read these things, if for no other reason, to understand uh, how the, uh, the capitalists present war. And there are some important, there are some, there is information in there, but you have to, when you read this stuff, understand the viewpoint behind it. So for example, I was reading Defense News the other day, and they had a, uh, a sizable article on how a general, McMaster, says that artificial intelligence is the next frontier of military and intelligence operations. Okay. And it had some you know, experts in there, yada, yada, yada. It did not mention that McMaster is on the board of several world corporations, big and small, profiting from investments in AI. Now that is just blatant uh, journalistic malpractice, but it gives you an idea of how uh, the game works, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to media. Next slide, please. So the war industry is spread, as you know, across every state in the United States, all 50. However, there are concentrations of the war industry. Where is it concentrated? It's concentrated near our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. So if you draw a line from Northern Virginia 
through the nation's capital up to about Baltimore. That is where all, all war, war corporations have offices there, all the big ones. But they also have a lot of smaller war corporations, particularly contracting and intelligence, because there are a lot of intelligence agencies in and around that area. Um, and there are a lot of lobbying firms that go on in there as well. The Dallas-Fort Worth conglomerate in Texas is a huge place. Uh, the F-35, as you know, is assembled there. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama, which got its start back in the 40s after World War II, where many of the prominent Nazi rocket scientists were taken in order to build the U.S. rocket program, civilian and military. And now it's just it's swarming, absolutely swarming with war corporations, Huntsville is. Greater Boston, Massachusetts, trying to leverage the academic knowledge at many of the nation's top academic institutions. California, particularly in Silicon Valley, the big tech firms, but also down in Los Angeles and further south in San Diego. For example, General Atomics, whenever there's a US drone strike, it's done with a General Atomics MQ-9 Reaper drone. General Atomics is headquartered in San Diego, and in Poway, which is just outside of San Diego, is where the Reapers are produced and assembled. Denver, Littleton, Centennial, Aurora, Colorado. A lot of space activity and intelligence activity goes on there. Florida, all over the place, particularly in Orlando and Tampa. And Beaver Creek in Dayton, Ohio. Next slide, please. How do war corporations present themselves? This is masterful propaganda. You are in the business of war. You are profiting from death. Civilians dying overseas. U.S. troops dying overseas. But also, civilians dying here at home from the money that is not given to them, that should be given to them, but is instead, in the discretionary funds, diverted into war. So that's one of the opportunity costs here. We could have education, healthcare for all, decent infrastructure. Yeah, healthcare we could, yeah. for all. Yeah. Yeah. Single payer. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, so they present themselves masterful public relations. We're just providing solutions. We are providing solutions. We're supporting critical programs of national significance. This means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. But it sounds great. We're giving our troops the tools they need. We're being against that. Troops need the tools. What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Solving the most daunting challenges facing our customers. We are a valued partner, partner to essential government agencies. We're job creators. We're creating jobs. Next slide, please. Corporate authority, if you take away anything from this presentation, we must understand that the rise and the solidification of the military industrial complex is a direct result of corporations attaining more and more authority in government and in public life over the years. From the 1970s onward, this is a concerted effort. Next slide, please. The Lewis Powell memo. Lewis Powell was a businessman's businessman. He eventually went on to be a Supreme Court justice. He was a capitalist capitalist, probably a better way to, to phrase that. And he wrote a memo in 1971 to, uh, in 86, an existing prohibition on corporate expenditure was deemed unconstitutional, basically leaving, allowing corporations to utilize nonprofits as another way to influence government and influence policy. Citizens United, FEC, you know this one allowed corporations to basically spend unlimited amounts in the political process. And then McCutcheon, FEC, 2014, got rid of the total number of limits, the total limit of the number of times you can give over, I think, it was a two-year period. Yeah, next slide, please. So how does the war industry influence federal policy? You know lobbying. You know campaign finance. You're running for Congress. You're running for Congress. I'm the corporation. I fund your campaign. I fund your campaign. Whoever wins. I own you. Okay? I own you. You owe me everything. Uh, another thing we see is if you go to the Pentagon's website, defense.gov, and click on leadership, you can see the biographies of all the top civilian leaders in the Pentagon. Back in the day, say in the 1960s, these civilian offices at the top of the Pentagon were populated mostly by career civil servants. These days, 
They are populated by corporate executives who rotate into the Pentagon for a couple of years, gain knowledge, and then rotate back into the corporate boardroom where they use that knowledge for increased corporate profit. And by the way, when they were on, when they were on the inside, they influence policy in order to advance corporate interests. The revolving door, which you all know about. Media and think tanks, we can talk more about that. Think tanks, the job of a think tank is to put out information that benefits whoever funds the think tank. So if you're big oil, you fund the think tank, the think tank will put out information that says, uh, maybe climate change isn't as bad as we think, or hey, you know, there these uh, these um, oil firms, these oil corporations, they're they're philanthropic. They make these donations. They they, look, they funded this you know art center. They funded that thing over there, this museum, that type of thing. Okay, think tanks are not neutral by any means. So in the war industry knows that the war industry funds think tanks. Think tanks hype threats. They inflate threats. This is how you get. Oh, China is the new bad guy. Oh, 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 Russia's the new bad guy. Oh, no, don't forget about the Iranians. The Cubans. The Cubans are also the bad guy. They've been the bad guy since the 60s. Uh, Venezuelans. The Venezuelans are the bad guys. Don't forget about North Korea. This is constant. It's constant. And so then corporate media, when they need an expert, they cite the think tanks. Hard. The jobs cards are excellent at pressuring politicians by saying, hey, you know, we can come to your district, bring 200 jobs. It's, very, it's another way to apply pressure to the political process. They never, the lawyers make sure in the fine print that they never have to come through with the total number of jobs that they say they're going to. Never. They'll come through with 100, and sometimes those jobs are temporary. Often they are menial, menial labor. You know, you're going and you're, um, you're at a shipyard and you're just all day just, you know, scraping rust off of something. No, that's not fulfilling work. We can create a society where there's fulfilling work, where people are actually doing what they love. This is not impossible. Mm -hmm. And yet, corporations running the policy process within the Pentagon. So I spend my free time, for better or for worse, studying the Pentagon's contracting. And in these contracts, you see corporations being tasked to come up with policy recommendations in offices in the Pentagon. The Pentagon is enormous, by the way. It's just, it's just a blob. It's so big that they have to have another organization adjacent to the Pentagon called uh, WHS, uh, Washington Headquarters Services, which is basically the administrative first um, location of the Pentagon and of the military establishment writ large. And corporations are all in there. Next slide, please. Corporations running policy process. These are a few examples. Um, just one example. CACI, developing and managing policies and practices for acquisition within part of the U.S. Navy. Okay, so the Navy has a billion offices. Jackie is one of the, in one of the top offices coming up with policies and recommendations for how to acquire goods and services from the very war industry that Kaki is a part of. Next slide, please. Cost. We can get into this more. I'm winding down my portion and I'm very excited for Brian's portion. The costs are enormous. Like we alluded to earlier, we could have nice things in this country. We could end homelessness in this country. There's plenty of money. There's plenty of money to go around. No question about it. So one of the costs, discretionary funding going toward profiteering and permanent warfare and destruction instead of human need. Another cost, mass surveillance. Surveillance by government and corporations. The surveillance state that Edward Snowden in 2013 showed us is carried out mostly by corporations, many of which I named earlier. They have no interest in dismantling this. None whatsoever. And as long as corporate authority is so massive and so powerful, it will never go away. The surveillance state will never go away. Injury, death, and trauma. Civilians overseas bear the brunt of this permanent warfare state. And, of course, U.S. troops as well. By the way, most U.S. troops are not um, uh, bloodthirsty, horrible, horrible humans. They join the military, according to the Pentagon's own statistics, they join the military for financial benefit. Because it's a steady job, for loan repayment, for uh, GIVA, for college, for educational benefits, tuition assistance. These are the reasons why people join the military. And the ruling class knows this. The ruling class knows this. Militarization of U.S. society, 100 seconds to midnight, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists shows us that we are about as close to a nuclear war right now as we've ever been in our nation's history. 100 seconds. 100 seconds to midnight, exactly, sir. 
uh, pollution. The war industry is a massive polluter, and the Pentagon is a massive polluter. Most platforms, whether it's an aircraft or a aircraft carrier or a submarine or a, a land vehicle or a drone, most of these platforms run on fossil fuels. And this, you have a huge global footprint of all of these platforms. And the bases themselves are, are, are hugely polluted. And they often, many times, the generators run on fossil fuel as well. There are only a few platforms in the US military that do not run on fossil fuel. They run on nuclear fuel. They are submarines, certain submarines, and certain aircraft car carriers. But the um, platforms that launch from the aircraft carrier, for example, run on fossil fuel. Uh, and then rampant mental illness. One of the reasons, not exclusively, but one of the reasons why everyone is struggling with mental illness in this society is because we are such a militarized society and because what could be helping us, this discretionary funding, is not going toward mental health programs, it's not going to programs of social uplift, it's not going to education, it's not going to health care, none of this stuff. It is going toward war and permanent uh, surveillance. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, you know the, you know the numbers. The, Military intelligence budget is absolutely enormous. Most of this, by the way, goes to corporations. Okay, so I think it was 20, uh, fiscal year 2021 maybe, uh, the military budget was around $750 billion, give or take, depending on what you're including in there. And uh, 420, a little over 420 billion of that went to corporations. Next slide, please. So very briefly, and I can get into this more often uh, down the road, it, what was the Pentagon up to in Eastern Europe prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Again, I'm not excusing the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm providing context. This just doesn't happen in the back. Nobody, no matter how demonic they are, just decides, ah, we're going to invade another country. Okay? There is context. There is history. U.S. military and industry was militarizing Eastern Europe for years not just Ukraine, but other countries, for years prior to the February uh, 2022 invasion of Ukraine. Increasing the troop, U.S. troop presence, presence in Eastern Europe, in Poland, in the Baltic states, in Romania, and elsewhere. Uh, the U.S. military has something called preposition stock. Preposition stock is any of the big stuff you need to fight a war. It has that in many places across Europe as a whole. Okay. It never, by the way, the U.S. military never left Europe after the Cold War. It reduced its troop presence. It did not leave. And since the new great power competition arose several years back against Beijing and Moscow, the troop presence has slowly gone up. And I can get into how that came about if you'd like. Uh, it also has nuclear weapons stored all across Europe. Uh, building military infrastructure in the contracts that I study. U.S. and European construction firms are tasked with building and repairing constantly, ceaselessly, this never stops, building and repairing U.S. and allied military infrastructure in Eastern Europe. Provocative military exercises along Russia's borders. Russia is not flying bombers in uh, the Hudson Bay. It is not flying bombers along Florida's coast. Okay? The U.S. is, however, flying bombers and has been flying bombers along Russia's coast. It has been, it has been doing what they call freedom of navigation exercises in the Baltic and in the Black Sea. Training. It has trained allied militaries all across Eastern Europe. It has Washington. Washington, D.C. has abandoned arms treaties. Unilateral, said, ah, we're done, we're out, rip it up, gone, okay? The anti-ballistic missile treaty, I think, was they left in 2002. The INF treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, I think they left in 2019, but I could be wrong on that. And the Open Skies Treaty, they left uh, last year, I believe. Open Skies was designed to have just a little bit of transparency in the other country's nuclear posture within their own country. So the Russians, in coordination with the U.S., would fly over the U.S., in um, aircraft together and say, all right, we, we see these sites, we see that site, and vice versa, okay? It, uh, is it vice versa or vice versa? Vice versa. Vice versa. Vice versa. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so that, that it wasn't a um, it wasn't a perfect system, but Open Skies did have a little bit of truth uh, and fostered a little bit of understanding uh, between the two parties. And um, investigative reporting has shown that Washington is trying to undermine repeatedly the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which most countries in the world support. That's right. Also, as the New York Times reported in 2019, I think it was July 2019, but it could have been June, cyber operations against Russia. In 2019 and prior, the U.S. government was engaged in, and since, engaged in cyber attacks and cyber operations against Russia's cyber infrastructure, including but not limited to electricity, power plants. And on top of that, I believe it was the end of last year, uh, there's a very good investigative journalist called, last name Dorfman, I think it's Stephen Dorfman, but I, uh, I could be wrong on the first name. He works for Yahoo News, and he had a very good investigative piece about how, under the Trump administration, Trump gave CIA um, a basically blank check authority to conduct cyber attacks against targets of its choosing at a time of its choosing. So CIA usually has to go to the White House, usually has to go to the White House to get legal authority. The White House will say, yes, you can do this, or no, you can't do this, and the CIA will say, all right, well, whatever. And, but what they did under this was, you don't have to keep coming back, CIA. You don't have to keep coming back to the White House. You choose what targets you want to attack using cyber weapons at a time of your choosing. And then what I see every day is sales from the U.S. war industry to every single Eastern European country except for Belarus. So if you're sitting in Moscow, this is what you see. Right. This is not excusing the attack on Ukraine, but it is to provide context yeah. of history. And I think that's it. I'll turn it over to uh, Ryan you. right now. Thank yeah. you so much. That's what's up. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll sit for a minute to give my talk a piece of paper to read off of. Um, thanks so much, Christian. That was really informative really systematic in breaking down what we're dealing with here. Unfortunately, I think most people in this country have no idea of what's going on, the level of corporate control, and the level in particular of military corporations' control. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more, picking up on the last note that Christian talked about, the focusing more specifically on Ukraine. And in particular, I want to talk about Ukraine as something of a meta-crisis, meaning that this crisis in Ukraine, this war in Ukraine, is much bigger than just Ukraine. Now, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, had larger geopolitical and regional implications, but this war stretches far beyond, in many senses, the scopes of those wars. The current situation with Russia and China and the US and NATO has been described as, and correctly so, I think, a new Cold War. But there's a deeper crisis going on than was happening in the previous Cold War, and what is called sometimes in US policy circles, the global American-led political and economic order, in the sense that the American empire is in a state of decline. Now, it's not to say it's over, it's done, and as they say, dying beasts are most dangerous. The elite in this country have made a series of major miscalculations with the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. They spent two decades, trillions of dollars, and were unable to establish pliable and pliant puppet states in those countries. In Afghanistan, obviously, the Taliban defeated the US and has retaken their country. Um, and in Iraq, the current Iraqi government is increasingly hostile to the US. Most of the Iraqi oil is controlled by Chinese companies. Iran has gained significant influence in Iraq and has used that to spread influence throughout the region. Now, the interests of the American capitalists who run this empire are different from the interests of the people in this country. But I want to point out, these two decades of wars, although they had some benefits, some people profited immensely, were overall a huge waste for the American empire. They sank a huge amount of resources into these wars and got very little in terms of increasing their power and influence globally out of them. Quite the opposite. These wars, as well as the war in Ukraine, show uh, some, something of a dangerous pattern. Empires in decline, run by increasingly out of touch and delusional elites, from Donald Trump to Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton, often seek to reclaim the lost, their lost glory 
through aggressive military assertion. This is quite dangerous, and they're talking openly about the stuff in Ukraine in terms of winning a nuclear war against Russia. That's being openly discussed by the US media. And recently, even on Meet the Press, they had a, a whole thing about what would nuclear war with China look like and how would the US win that? It, it's getting quite surreal. This conflict, as I mentioned, is about far more than Ukraine. E the war is likely to drag on for some time, but even if it did end in the short or medium term, the fundamental issues that gave rise to this war will remain. In particular, great power competition is only likely to intensify in the coming years, especially as we're entering into a period of major global economic downturn. Given this new Cold War and the dangers of the US elite potentially could turn this into a hot war, whether it be in Ukraine, over Taiwan, or elsewhere, those of us here in the US who are willing to stand against the war machine have our work cut up for us. The future the elite have planned for us is no future at all, even if the US wins this Cold War. We need to take a long, hard look at the global situation, as well as the major dynamics domestically, and chart a course forward to find a way out of this mess. This is no easy task, but I hope that today we can take a few modest steps to gain some clarity on it. So what's going on in Ukraine? I hope that many of you are aware that this war was in many senses provoked by the US and NATO. Christian just spoke on that a bit. Um, and like him, I'm opposed to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I, I'm not looking to apologize for Russia's actions, but I think we need to understand the rules of the great power competition, the dynamics that are playing out, as these things don't happen in a vacuum. There's a certain logic or rules to these great games that the big bullies play. And countries establish certain red lines, which if crossed, will elicit a reaction, including a military reaction. The US crossed numerous of these in the case of Ukraine, which elicited the response of an invasion by Russia. The US elite were aware of this and their actions leading up to it. Uh, they were fairly open throughout these provocations about their intent to weaken Russia with the war in Ukraine. But it's often hard for us in the US to step out of the media bubble in this country and to see the world other than through the warped lens of American exceptionalism and related jingoism. So let me put it in terms that may clarify the matter. Imagine for a second that Russia signed a major military alliance with Venezuela, Colombia, Jamaica, and other Latin American countries, aimed at containing American influence in the region, but they promised not to expand this alliance any further. <laughs> then, Russia breaks this promise and stages a pro-Russian coup in Panama. They promptly take control of the Panama Canal, station Russian troops there, and begin conducting major war games off the coast of Florida, simulating a war with the United States. A few years later, they signed deals and staged some coups in Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador. More Russian troops are deployed to these countries, along with missile systems and nuclear-armed bombers. Russia cuts arms deals with them as well, flooding these countries with the latest Russian weaponry. Then, a pliant US met puppet in Mexico is replaced in a coup, which Russian diplomats are caught bragging about in leaks with a Russian puppet. This Russian puppet then promptly arms far-right fascist forces with weapons Russia is pouring into Mexico, stations them on the US-Mexico border, and makes them some of the leading forces in the Mexican military. And then this pro-Russian government in Mexico announces, with Russian support, that it is starting plans to acquire nuclear weapons. The world would have blown up already. The story's over. <laughs> exactly. In this scenario, no one in the US will be surprised when the US government took military action in Mexico and likely beyond. Of course, the scenario I'm describing is not fiction. The proper names are just changed. Exactly. This is basically exactly what has happened with NATO expansion over the past few decades, with Mexico and this fictional account being Ukraine. The Russian diplomats caught bragging in the coup of Mexico in this thought experiment were, of course, US diplomats, including current Under Secretary of State Victoria Nuland. In 2014, tapes leaked of her talking with then US Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, about plots to replace Russia's pro, uh, sorry, Ukraine's pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, with the US puppet, which is exactly what happened shortly thereafter in the 2014 Euro Maiden protests in, uh, in Ukraine. Again, if the US invaded Mexico in this situation, it wouldn't be a surprise to those of us here in the United States. I would certainly condemn the US in this situation, but I would also be sure to condemn the Russian government for the provocations and escalations that led up to the invasion. To not do so would be surreal, 
Unfortunately, most American media has departed from reality, and there's a question of how much reality they were dealing with before this invasion, but that's another thing. They've departed from reality into the realm of sur the surreal. Watching MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News often leaves one with the impression of being Alice in Wonderland. The stories presented in American news media about Ukraine are often so outlandish and oversimplified that one could be forgiven for thinking that they were satire. The entire explanation of the war, for example, is often reduced to personality defects, real or imagined of Putin, a narrative that plays well in our extremely individualist culture, but which has little relation to reality. The dangers of nuclear war, if mentioned at all in the US media, are generally shrugged off with assertions that the US can win any nuclear conflict. Given the US military's recent track record of defeats, this would almost be funny if it did not indicate that the people who run this country are really as deranged as the generals and politicians depicted in Stanley Kubrick's famous film, Dr. Strangelove. Outside of the US, the complexities of the situation are often better understood, although not, not always. Condemning Russia's invasion often goes hand in hand with condemning the aggression and provocations of the US and NATO. Even the Pope recently emphasized the central role that the US played in provoking this war. But here in the United States, American chauvinism runs so deep that not even a single supposedly progressive Democratic politician stood against the latest bill that allocates tens of billions of more dollars for this war. Not AOC, not Bernie, not Cori Bush, not Ilhan Omar, not one of them. The strongest opposition in D.C. that we are currently seeing, and it's pretty minor, came from a small number of politicians supported by the populist right. And actually, most liberal voters are now cheering for this war, a point that I will come back to later. The only hope we have is if we can get out, the only hope we have, if we can get out of this morass of confusion and propaganda promoted by the pompous elite who run this country. But this is easier said than, said than done in many senses. Still, a bit of work together can go a long way. One basic step we can take is to cast aside illusions that anyone in Washington, D.C., Democrat or Republican, will save us. I'm going to keep going into the Pacific water real quick. But before talking about a few ideas I have on the way forward, I want to spell out a bit more of what I mean by the Ukraine war being a meta-crisis. As I think clarity in the present situation is essential if we're to have any hope of getting out of this mess. We have to really look at what's going on in Ukraine and beyond in, this, in the world we're living in. Long before the war, as I mentioned, Ukraine had been a site of tension between the US uh, and its NATO allies and Russia. But this meta-crisis is about more than Russia. It's intrinsically linked to US competition with China over who will be the top dog in the global pecking order. Given the long-standing push to isolate Russia economically and politically by the United States, the Russian elite have grown closer with China than with the EU and the US. As part of Obama's plan to contain the rise of China, he outlined a strategy known as the Pivot to the Pacific. In this strategy, the US planned to A, get most of its military out of the Middle East and reposition the military to contain China, mostly in the Pacific. B, develop domestic fossil fuel infrastructure to reduce dependence on the Middle East oil supplies and ensure that the US would have access to its own production of oil and other fossil fuels for any future world war. And C, keep the Saudis and UAE in their camp and split Qatar off from Iran by building a series of pipelines for oil and gas to Europe, and D, use these pipelines to weaken Russia's dominant position in the EU gas markets, where, at the time, Russia enjoyed it, or controlled about 33% of the gas markets in Europe and around 100% of those markets in Eastern Europe. This plan, the pivot to the Pacific, largely failed in many respects, in part due to the ineptitude of the US state, in part due to strong opposition from Russia, and in particular in Syria, where Assad played a key role in blocking the construction of these proposed pipelines. And Syria's vetoing of the pipelines at Russia's behest was a key reason the Obama administration was so rabid in their efforts to topple Assad, at least until Obama's own generals opposed him in this and started sharing intelligence with the Assad government about the locations of the far-right forces that Obama was arming there. But that's a whole other story, although it follows, it follows a similar pattern to what's going on in Ukraine. Now, I mentioned the Syrian civil war, and I don't want to get into it in detail right now, but because as much the Syrian civil war, as much as NATO expansion eastward towards Russia, is a central part of the background leading up to the Ukraine war. I'm trying to use this example of Syria 
to illustrate the underlying nature of the global system in which we live. As the world is presently structured, competition between the great powers is a zero-sum game. The world is parceled up into relative spheres of influence, and any gain for the US is a loss for another power and vice versa. This is not, about, not just about control of key resources like oil and gas and other fossil fuels, but also about the control of market share and access to cheap labor. So is it any surprise in this regard that when the US, through maneuvers in Ukraine, moved to push Russia out of key markets in Eastern and Central Europe, that there was a response from Russia? Ukraine is a key transit point for Russian oil and gas to the rest of Europe, and the, Ukrainian econo sorry, the Russian economy largely revolves around the export of fossil fuels. Unless we understand some of these dynamics, Eat, uh, in, uh, sorry, unless we understand some of these dynamics, events in the international and even domestic arena will remain unclear to us. And we will be susceptible to all sorts of surreal US state propaganda, which reduces geopolitics to pseudo-Freudian analysis of the personalities of world leaders and or thinly veiled racist stereotypes about other countries and peoples. This Russian response and these larger dynamics are not unique to Ukraine. Much of what is left of the anti-war movement in this country has not taken stock of this fundamental shift in the global situation. The US enjoyed a period of relatively uncontested global dominance after the fall of the Soviet Union. And during this period, the US waged wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as elsewhere, which while disastrous for the peoples of those countries, did not threaten a global conflagration and major world war. But now, with the rise of China and the relative strength of Russia, we can expect that future US wars will be intense proxy competitions with these powers. This is very important for us in the United States to understand. The nature of these wars the US is getting involved in is fairly different now. It doesn't mean we shouldn't oppose them. In some senses, it means opposing them harder, as we're seeing today. In this so-called great game between these big bullies, we, the people of the United States, and the people of the world lose regardless of who wins. The situation is increasingly dangerous and unstable, especially as we are now heading into a major economic downturn, as I mentioned earlier, which could well be worse than the Great Depression. With the shrinking pie, competition between these big bullies is only going to intensify as they fight with each other to control the world and pieces of the world. Right now, it is hard to overstate the idiotic and delusional buffoonery of the US elite. Salivating over the prospects of weakening Russia, they are recklessly risking nuclear war and have imposed a series of economic sanctions on Russia, which, while they've had a limited impact on the Russian economy, are causing chaos globally in everything from energy markets to global food supplies and will likely lead to major famines around the world this year. Up until recently, the Biden administration has refused to have any diplomatic contact with the Russian government about this war, period. No discussion. None at all. In fact, today, the US and the UK stated that there will be no off-ramp for de-escalation. Now, recently, actually, the minimal contact did happen through the Secretary of Defense, not the diplomats. They have pushed, the US elite have pushed escalation after escalation. Politicians from Biden to Lindsey Graham have openly called for the assassination of Putin and regime change. Think about the implications of this for a minute. They're trying to sow chaos and destabilization in a country with the most nuclear weapons in the world. I mean, does that sound like a sane and rational and well thought out policy? I don't think so. Uh, but beyond that, think in reverse. What if China or Russia called for the assassination of Biden for his support for the war in Yemen or the recent deployment of US troops to Somalia, where atrocities in both those places uh, are being committed similar to those that are happening in the Ukraine war? The US elite has flooded Ukraine with arms, as Christian already spoke to, spending at a pace that exceeds the rate of the war in Afghanistan. In fact, with the latest package, in just three months, US spending on Ukraine has exceeded the annual budget of the war in Afghanistan. The idea that the elite of this country, whether they be Republicans or Democrats or big capitalists with no party affiliation, care about the people of Ukraine is a joke. 
First, we can see from Hillary Clinton to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, they have made it clear that they want to drag this war on as long as possible to bleed Russia out. They don't want a quick victory for Ukraine. And the insurgency training the CIA has been doing in Ukraine for years shows that their plan from the beginning was to sacrifice Ukraine in a long, drawn-out conflict with Russia that they hope can last years, if not decades. Second, the weapons the US has supplied to Ukraine, in many cases, have been provided to the furthest right groups in Ukrainian society. Neo-Nazi groups like the Azov Battalion, who are now being cheered as heroes by the US media, are some of the major fighting forces in the Donbass region. These forces trace their roots back to Ukrainian Nazi collaborators who, during the Second World War, carried out many massacres against tens of thousands of Jews, Poles, and others. The Azov Battalion and other far-right forces in Ukraine wear swastikas and other Nazi regalia on their uniforms. They do Sieg Heils, and they openly proclaim their support for Hitler, and they openly speak of their plans to exterminate the Jews. Those are their words. They have been the center of international training for white supremacists and far-right forces who have traveled from the United States and other countries around the world, including Europe and New Zealand, to train with them learning on the arms the U.S. government provided for them. Even the FBI has voiced their concerns about this fact. The Christchurch shooter in New Zealand cited the Azov Brigade as his major influence and inspiration. He trained with them in Ukraine. The recent mass murderer in Buffalo also cited the Azov Battalion as his inspiration. And on the front of his deranged manifesto was one of their logos, and they feature prominently throughout his 180 pages. But what could go wrong with the US government sending huge amounts of arms to groups like this? It's very clear, of course, if we just look at things for a minute. The future of, for Ukrainians is obviously quite bleak right now with this proxy war and Russia's invasion. But I want to emphasize the future that the US elite had in store for, the, for Ukrainians if Russia had invaded was also quite grim. The US and NATO's sponsorship of far-right forces speaks to this. These forces have committed atrocities in recent years in Ukraine, not only against the ethnic Russians, who make up a sizable portion of the Ukrainian population, but also against Jews, Muslims, ethnic Ukrainians, and others. What's more, joining the EU, which is often framed as the goal for Ukraine, is not a rosy prospect. For poor Eastern European countries, joining the EU means the imposition of devastating neoliberal policies that open the country for loot by wealthy US and EU companies. They would be handing the keys to their economy over to French, German, and American banks, so to speak. And they already had done that to some extent, but joining the EU would have taken it that much further. This leads to mass exoduses from the countries. For example, we can see this in Poland, where after they joined the EU, over a million people migrated out of the country per year on average. These refugees from neoliberal structural adjustment policies were not covered in the media. We didn't see the very real and sad pictures of them as they became migrant laborers in wealthy EU countries, working conditions that numerous investigations have found to be akin to slavery. Countless others from this, these poor Eastern European countries like Poland, after they joined the EU, were trafficked becoming sex slaves in the brothels of wealthy EU countries like Germany and the Netherlands that have legalized the sex trade. So let's cast aside illusions the US elite have humanitarian goals in mind with this war. This is pure political calculation to weaken a strategic rival. Arming and promoting far-right forces to secure corporate and state interests is nothing new for the US. It is right out of a long established playbook that people around the world from Central America to the Balkans have had to endure numerous times before. There is no humanitarian goal or purpose here. It is pure realpolitik, though the US elite seems to be fairly incompetent players in this game at present. And I don't want to talk about the incompetence and the ineptitude. Again, this doesn't mean the US is not dangerous. The US military is very powerful. The US intelligence agencies torture and assassinate people left and right. What I'm trying to point out is that we're an empire in decline. The elite who run this country are out of touch with the basic reality. They are making a series of miscalculations. And this is not well understood in the US. 
There was, for example, a lot of media attention on the faux pas, real or imagined, of Donald Trump. Many of them were real. A few of them were made up. And the media became kind of a constant cycle of what, what did Trump say today. Um, but the truth is that the Biden administration is not much better. While they initially claimed to unite Europe in boycotting Russia, this has turned out to be largely overstated grandiosity. Some EU countries, like Poland, are quite bellicose. But major powers in Europe, especially Germany and France, have been advocating a more moderate approach to dealing with Russia, and have been resisting US pressure to refuse to negotiate with Putin. Some European countries have even been quite defiant uh, in efforts to isolate Russia, such as Hungary uh, and other EU countries, although to a lesser degree, they've grown more sympathetic to Russia in recent years, uh, in particular due to some skilled diplomatic maneuvering on Russia's part, uh, where the US has kind of taken a more heavy-handed approach Major US allies like Brazil and India, and even functional vassals like Mexico, have refused to join in US sanctions against Russia. And India, despite being part of Quad, the new US alliance to contain China, excuse me, has just a few days ago issued a joint statement with Russia, China, and Brazil as part of BRICS, pushing for a more multipolar world. Numerous other countries around the world have also refused to toe the line. In short, short the world is far from united in opposing Russia and supporting the US imperial maneuvers. And while the much hyped US sanctions were supposed to cripple the Russian economy and reduce the ruble to rubble, as Biden put it, this has been far from the case. The ruble is stronger versus the dollar than before the war and has reached eight year highs against the euro. Oil and gas revenue were up 50% for Russia compared to last year. And when US companies like Visa, MasterCard, and McDonald's left Russia, Russian companies and state entities swooped in, gobbling up their vacated market share and creating hundreds of millions of dollars in new revenue for Russian corporations and the state treasury. In short, efforts by the Biden administration to isolate Russia economically and politically have been an abysmal failure. And side note, that while they have focused so much of their attention on Russia, their diplomatic efforts in other parts of the world have been neglected and or similarly inept. They have, for example, failed to appoint an ambassador to more than a dozen Latin American countries, including Brazil, which is the largest economy in Latin America, despite being in office for over 16 months. This reflects a growing trend where the US elite increasingly favors military might and economic coercion over the subtleties of diplomacy. Of course, all three of these methods are an essential part of the imperialist playbook, but the tendency towards a more ham-fisted and bellicose approach is quite notable. What's more, provoking Russia into this war and sanctioning them has created a global crisis in food and raw materials, despite failing to cripple the Russian economy. Russia is a huge exporter of food, as is Ukraine. The two combine to provide 28% of global wheat exports, 29% of barley, and 15% of corn exports, as well as 75% of sunflower oil exports. The majority of this food is sold to poor Middle Eastern and African countries, which do not have strong domestic food supplies. Russia is also the largest exporter of raw materials in the world, not just fossil fuels, but also aluminum, nickel, and other things which are essential to production of goods and services around the world. And now, there are critical global shortages of many of these raw materials, as well as massive inflation due to these shortages. Since the war began, the chaos in global supply chains has caused other countries around the globe to announce major protectionist measures on the export of food and other products. In a highly globalized economy, this means more disruptions to supply chains and more shortages of fuel and food. What we are seeing in Sri Lanka right now with the major protests against the government because of these shortages and unrest is just the beginning. And this is a divided thing. It's a very dire situation for the people. But as we saw in the Arab Spring, in these situations, people do rise up and topple oppressive governments. So it's not all bleak. And I'll come to that more towards the end. In the US, we even are uh, projected to face major diesel shortages in the East Coast at least this summer, which means disruption of goods and services, more shortages of essential things, not just baby food. And as well as rolling blackouts from California to the Midwest, which may last for years, according to Bloomberg, a recent report they put out. And The Economist just published an article yesterday, I believe, saying that fam a famine of biblical proportions is brewing globally. And with all this, the, uh, 
And with all of the US diplomatic and economic responses failing so spectacularly to isolate Russia, is it any surprise that the elite in this country have ramped up military spending, seemingly believing that this is their last and best resort? At the current rate of spending, the US expenditure <coughs> on the war will exceed the entire annual budget of the Russian military in a few months, maybe as soon as next month. Much like with the war with Iraq and Afghanistan, this money will do little more than enrich a few billionaire bankers and weapons manufacturers while sponsoring death and destruction in Ukraine. It seems likely at the present, given the present dynamics, that it will fail to secure the interests of the US empire and the capitalists that run this country. Despite the propaganda here in the United States, Russia is winning the war in Ukraine, although with some sloppiness. They have captured most of the Donbass, secured a land bridge to Crimea, and will begin their push west to Odessa soon, possibly continuing all the way to Moldova and making Ukraine a landlocked country. Meanwhile, the US cannot produce Javelin missiles fast enough to supply the Ukrainians with them at, pre at the pre present rate of use. Similar bottlenecks are disrupting the supply of other key military hardware, even as the US elite throw ever larger sums of money at the problem, which seems to be their solution to most things, throw money at it and hope it'll work out, which of course is not generally a way to fix things. It is a great way to enrich a number of corporations and, and people. All of this paints a grim picture. A delusional and bellicose elite running this country, driving us to the brink of nuclear war, and helping to create a major global famine in the process. However, I'm an optimist. But in order to be optimistic in a real sense, and not just naive, we need to face the stark and difficult realities in front of us. It's the only way we can chart a course forward out of this big mess in which we are currently living. And speaking on this, in the point that standing against the US provocations and escalations does not mean supporting Putin for this war that he's waging, the Russian elite are waging. I want to quote from uh, uh, German Marxist Willem Liebknecht, who people may know as a comrade of Rosa Luxemburg, and was killed uh, by the German government during the revolution in 1919. Yeah, the Social Democrats uh, killed him. He said, our primary enemy is at home during World War I. He was speaking against the tendency of the Social Democrats in Germany and, and around the world to rally behind their own elite during that war, to say, we need to support them, support the motherland, support the fatherland. This was a trend then. We see it as a trend now. Trudy spoke so well about it. It's very dangerous and disturbing. But if we look at things clearly and what the people are who run this country, what they're doing, what sort of calculus they're making, then it becomes clear that they really are not our friends, that we can't play a game of lesser evilism and say, oh, because they're opposing Putin, we should rally behind them. We can't be drawn in by the war propaganda that frames Putin as the new Hitler. And I think we should oppose Putin in the war there that he's waging. But to be drawn in by this war propaganda that the US leader pushing, encourage us to line up behind the US war machine, behind all these corporations that Christian just broke down for us, and to support them in supposedly fighting the good fight. While Putin is certainly an oppressive ruler and his government is corrupt, that is something for the Russian people to deal with. I think we can and should support them in their battles against corruption, censorship, repression, and more. However, allowing our support for them to be channeled into the maneuvers of the US state will hurt the Russian people, not help them. Likewise, supporting the designs of the murderous and rapacious, and rapacious maniacs who run this country, based on the belief that they are sincere in their pledges to help Ukraine, is not only delusional, it is dangerous. Our compliance is essential, essential for the smooth functioning of the US empire. As we have seen in this country, mass mobilizations of dissent, and in particular, those that are able to reach the US troops and support their dissent are a massive impediment to the war machine. To Christian's point that most people who join the US military are not bloodthirsty maniacs. It's functionally an economic draft in this country. 80% of the rank and file troops are drawn from the 20% of the poorest parts of the country. And they're drawn in for reasons based on the economic devastation there, the hope often to have something of a better future, not crushed and get peonage. And if anti-war movement can't reach them, then we can't do so much. If instead of marching to the beat of the, if instead we remain pliant and march to the beat of the war drums, we have a very grim 
future in front of us, even if we avoid a nuclear war. Our compliance provides openings for the elite to carry out massive campaigns of censorship and suppression of dissent at home, as they did during World War I, and as they're doing right now. They're doing this right now, censoring, suppressing dissent at a level we haven't seen since McCarthyism in this country. And it's being done to applause, excitement, cheering from a lot of the liberal voices who are opposing the war of Iraq and Afghanistan. People, even within the elite, are being labeled as traitors for basic criticisms of US policy. And when people who are like, people like Tulsi Gabbard, who are part of the establishment, are raising criticisms and are being called traitors, then all of us, ordinary people, should be very worried. Because that tells us what the elite think of dissent. In the name of fighting Russian disinformation, people are being censored left and right on social media platforms. There's unprecedented coordination between major news networks, the CIA, the NSA, uh, the tech companies, and so on, to censor through an initiative which you can look up called the Trusted News Initiative, which was created by the BBC a number of years ago. And at the same time this is all going on, basic criticism of US foreign policy is increasingly being labeled as extremism, and the Biden administration has just announced a new war on domestic terror. This should make us quite frightened and concerned. Nominally, this is framed at white supremacist forces, but the real target is the people of this country. And you can see the Democrats' language, which, which is parallel to the neocons' language, where anyone who opposes them is increasingly labeled as extremist. We should think about that word seeping into the common language in the country. It's quite a dangerous operation that they're carrying out. People aren't, I think, nearly aware of it. It's not as much as they should be. Right now, it is not easy to take a stand against the US involvement in this war. Many Americans, steeped in the noxic, noxious logic of lesser evilism, are jumping for joy that they get to root for the home team again. Now that the US is supposedly the lesser evil compared to Putin, framed as new Hitler, and so on fed years of ridiculous conspiracy theories that Russia was responsible for the election of Donald Trump. Many liberals have been primed for this war and are now eagerly cheering the Biden administration as it sleepwalks to the edge of World War III. Of course, the Russiagate conspiracy theories are based on an unwillingness to look squarely at the way that the Democratic Party serves corporate interests as much as the Republicans do, and how many voters, in particular in rural parts of America, were disillusioned with Hillary's hollow promises after eight years of the Obama administration. This unwillingness to look at the hard reality in front of us is not isolated to Democratic Party voters. It is a common delusion in American society. But unless we cast aside such illusions, then we do not have hope, as we will constantly be fooled by the jingoism pumped out by corporate news networks, social media algorithms, and a fine intellectual class which makes its living licking the boots of the corporate elite. Mm. However, we can take real steps here and now to rebuild a movement in this country which is capable of taking a stand against this war and the broader designs of the American empire. The near total control of American society, which is not absolute control, but it is a lot of control, by the military industrial complex, the big banks, the corporate elite, and the politicians of these two rotten parties is not in the interest of the vast majority of the American people. These crooks who run this country are not only devastating the world, they are also bleeding us dry at home. However, rebuilding the anti-war movement will require us to face difficult truths, to reach out to untraditional allies. We need to break away from ritualistic protests which appease our consciences but do nothing to build up our movement and pressure the elite. We need to leave the comfortable confines of established middle class liberal circles and reach out to the poor and working class in particular. This means not only oppressed minorities and the poor sections of cities and housing projects, but also to the poor rural population, including a significant section of the white working class that supported Trump. It is not hard to do this, but it does mean breaking out of established habit habits and charting a new course forward that is not beholden to the logic of the two-party system of begging those in power to do the right thing. Only this way, only in this way can we get beyond the present lackadaisical morass in which the anti-war movement remains stuck. Ah. So, we have about an hour or so left before we gotta start cleaning up. Um, so we're gonna do some Q&A. Uh,
Um, so you mentioned a lot of what led up to what happened in Ukraine. And to the average person, they, they like, it's not their fault, they just don't care. And you can say that with a lot of issues that it really takes a, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of complexity to a lot of the stuff that we face in our daily lives. And a lot of people work, they want to come home, they want to drink a beer, eat, and spend time with their families. I see Putin invading, I'm not saying me, but like, I'm in, you know, someone who supports what the US is doing in Ukraine. I see what he's doing, and it just makes sense for me to be like, yes, we should oppose him. What's, you know, what is a way for our, I guess, to, to kind of construct an anti-US, anti-Russian, like, argument that, you know, without having to give them the whole backstory of this is a, a posturing by these two nations, and the Ru US was doing this, Russia was doing, you know, all this stuff, and just kind of simplifying it, I guess, into a coherent message that can reach all those people that you mentioned earlier. So, uh, more broadly, I've had a little bit, a little bit of success with my extended family on this matter, just by saying, number one, since 1945, the U.S. government has never, never been on the right side of a conflict, okay? And then, number two, I encourage them to turn on corporate media. And it doesn't answer your question, but it does provide a more broader uh, approach to the war machine in general. And I've had a little bit of success with some extended um, quote unquote liberal uh, family members who once they turn off corporate media and in their very limited spare time are uh, free to, uh, you know, like you said, they're working two jobs with you know, a side gig in a neoliberal economic system that absolutely beats up the working class. They are occasionally, they do occasionally have enough free time to look at some independent news websites and then they're able to formulate their own opinion. So I would say, encourage them to turn off corporate media uh, and to uh, understand that the US government has never been on the right side of conflict since uh, the end of the Second World War. So. Yeah, that, that, that's great, uh, great points. And if people can do that, there's, they can really start to break out of stuff. What I tried with, with limited success in talking to um, some people was to emphasize all the establishment voices in the U.S. People who are terrible, like Henry, Henry Kissinger even said, if the U.S. goes forward with Ukraine joining NATO, it would be a provocation for Russia and probably lead to war. And, and people like him, sometimes if people are you know, less aware of what's going on globally, will say, okay, well, let me give a pause if so many in the establishment were saying this would lead to war. Um, sometimes that's not enough. I mean, I, for what it's worth, I have my own father now thinks I'm a right-wing uh, extremist because I, I'm opposing this war. <laughs> so, but which, you know, people who know me, it, it's silly, but there is this thing that right now is saying, it, it, it's if you stand against this, you're probably a white supremacist, conspiracy theorist, so on, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's tough. It, it, and if people watch corporate news all day long, that's what they hear. That's what you hear, is that. And it's a weird situation because the only mainstream news source that's opposing this that I've seen is Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Now, I don't support Tucker Carlson. Yeah. I think it's good that at least he's opposing this despite all the other stuff he says that I don't agree with. But so there's a thing that they can do in most, most places say, oh, you oppose this, you must support Putin, you must be Tucker, and Putin equals Trump. So it all kind of fits. <laughs> and it's hard to get through that. I don't have any easy answers. I'd like to add to that. That in addition, when the U.S. was on the right side, it was allies with the Soviet Union, the foundation of Russia, fighting against the 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 air, the people who are now in Ukraine, the fascists. So in this case, it's really clear which side to be on. To me, I'm with Russia for this. Not in everything, but in this particular thing, yes. If I can keep going with the, I have some comments, but I'll wait my turn. We're just all kind of making our way across the room a little bit. So. so my question is, a real disturbing trend that I've seen in society, there is some awareness that this is threatening a nuclear confrontation between Russia and the US. And yet, a lot of people, including the elite in Washington and in general society, are kind of shrugging at this. Like, ah, so what? You know, and that's, to me, a disturbing and some of the new reaction 
I, I don't know historically if people have actually looked at the face of a, of this. Imagine during the Cuban Missile Crisis, if people said, oh, so much of the bomb goes off. You know, we, we had a good run. And so my question in particular is, Christian, do you see that among veterans? Is there somewhat of a, diff, a more attuned reaction to this, or is this shared there as well? And you know, what does this represent, and what, what the hell can we do about this? Because it's, it's quite disturbing if, if we're at that level right now. Uh, it's tough to say. I think the, uh, it's tough for me to speak to what the, uh, what U.S. veterans um, believe uh, across the border in general. I know that's not what you, what you were saying, but it's um, veterans like the rest of society are uh, fractured. They um, have different uh, political beliefs. I've seen some, I don't want to plug my, you know, my own group, but I'm <laughs> part of this group called the Eisenhower Media Network which takes independent um, veterans and some, I believe some former uh, civilian intelligence professionals who uh, are part of this part of this group who just, who are anti-war and who provide an alternative voice to what you get in corporate media, whether it's CNN, Fox, MSNBC, or whatever. So there are some people out there who understand the nature of the beast, but it, it, it's few and far between. Uh, among my, my veteran friends, there are some people who believe what is put on CNN and MSNBC, there are some who believe what is put on Fox News, so it's, it's, it's a mixed bag like anything else. I don't know how to, other than steady working class organizing, uh, oppose this, this beast. The one thing, uh, so what I'm studying right now in my spare time is fascism, and fascism is, it has a concrete definition, it is the blend of corporate might with government authority, with a lot of nationalism sprinkled up top. And what is that? That is the military industrial complex. So, and the only thing that fascism fears is a united, organized working class. And so, while we don't have a lot of time to achieve that, the end goal, if we can dodge nuclear war, is a working class that is united across racial lines and refuses to get split apart when the ruling class uses its handful of techniques. The, the te techniques that the ruling class uses to divide the working class are the same, they've always been the same, they don't have a new game, but we keep falling for it. So the only thing I can offer is uh, the hope, the glimmer, that at the end of the day, we get a united working class across racial lines that is able to form a front against the big business <coughs> industry, the big business groups that run the country, and dominate the political process, and yeah, it's, a, it's an incomplete answer, but that's the best I got. Yeah, yeah, just quickly, and then there's a lot of questions. I'll say, I think part of what we're seeing with this apathy is the population in this country has been trained, which is people are generally pretty hopeless, there's a lot of bad stuff going on, and there have been a tremendous proliferation of distractions put in front of people, of, of basically that promote a relatively unified ideology, which is that reality is no impediment to you doing you, doing whatever you want to do. So <laughs> if bad news, go on Instagram and look at some influencer buying a cup of coffee and think about how you can make it live your dreams. And, and of course, this doesn't actually happen for 99.99% .99 of people who, who do this, but there's been such a, I think the population has been trained right now, bad news to look away from reality. It's not everyone, and it's a tough situation, but I think that's why, part of the reason at least, we're seeing such apathy towards the risk of annihilation of the whole world in the not so distant future. In the back first. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Nuclear war was so eighties. Yeah. Just, just, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, the 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 it's it, we're, it's going to be years into this catastrophe until we can uh, put out enough ideas, some enough ideas, and things have gotten bad enough that there's uh, uh, any room for a change in, uh, in U.S. policy. Um, or possibly the election will trip it up and we'll be at war with Iran instead, which seems likely after, after, after the way Biden's doing, uh, going into his next election. But um, the questions are, um, if, we're, if we're looking eventually for negotiations in Ukraine, do we have to start pushing now for uh, autonomy for Donbass, since they voted, like Crimea, to get the hell out of that Nazi country we ruined and created with our coup in 2014. So is a slogan we're going to have to be looking at, Ukraine out of Donbass, because 
under 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 Russia's argument, um, at, uh, a legalistic argument for for, for under the UN, um, they recognize a, a breakaway republic and a new ally, and that they've actually they're there to repel an invasion. Um, and considering that the invading force is Nazis, um, that we installed uh, uh, in our coup, um, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with them. But the question is, if, if self-determination for Donbass isn't, isn't going eventually to be something we have to push in order to say that, no, a negotiation, it's not, we want negotiation in which, in which, at which Russia will give us everything we want, but we want a negotiation, um, and we are willing to give the people of Donbass their freedom as part of it. The other issue is just, let's remember when we talk about Putin that that is not a democracy, but that he has with the oligarchs we put in in the 90s. He does not have the power to make Russia a democracy. And he's an overwhelmingly popular leader with an overwhelming popular mandate. Now part of that is based on the shape that uh, autocracy and gangsterism in Russia is going to give to the, the process. But we have to remember that his leader, that, that Putin is more, is uh, the only possible democratic choice for that country, given the, uh, 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 the public's uh, 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 relative hatred for anyone else. Um, and that uh, our country isn't terribly democratic either, although it has a, uh, um, uh, although although it has as much freer speech and much fewer gangsters killing journalists. That isn't a question. That was just a statement. No, so, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, what happened? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the reality that the U.S. elite and the British elite who are kind of towing the line and hoping that somehow this they can parlay this into more global influence, which I'm doubtful about. But their dreams of regaining their lost empire are there. Their, their thought is there's no need to negotiate with, with Russia. Now the reality, as I said, is Russia is winning this war. I anticipate that eventually that will be acknowledged in negotiations and when they do happen, and that a significant portion of Ukraine will be carved off into either explicitly part of Russia or part of Russia's sphere of influence. Um, now, th that there's some complexities that has a divided character. As we noted, the situation in the Donbass for a lot of people do want to join Russia. Given the prospect of living under a kind of Azov rule, it's not so good. My own thought, though, is that in the US, it's not the key thing for us to clarify. It's not so central. We have so much more basic stuff to clarify to an American audience about the dynamics of these. And I think there's also a bunch of people we want to unite with who are going to have some different opinions on that. Uh, you know, exactly how to handle the national complexities of the stuff there. Uh, you know, I, I personally am against uh, annexations by Russia or any other country uh, of other countries' territory. Uh, there's a question of national movements that are sponsored by a powerful country. Those like, for example, the U.S. has been supporting the Kurdish movements in Syria. Now, the Kurdish movements they have in Syria, I think the Kurds have faced real oppression, especially in Turkey, the Kurds have faced real oppression. But if those movements become a proxy for US designs, then they have a different divided character and can become largely a proxy force. I, I don't know enough about the particular details of the Donbass to say one way or another, but I think in analyzing that situation, we've got to be pretty cautious. Um, so that's my own thoughts. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree with your answer with what you just said, but I, that is a lot of, uh, I wanted to say that I found your talk to be unbelievably courageous intellectually and politically. And I want to find ways that we can get copies of this, we can spread this everywhere, we can, there's parts of it I want to digest a lot more. But from the early right on, when you pointed out that the U.S. military, uh, the U.S. imperialism doesn't need to wage wars, it needs to win these wars and expand its empire, and it failed to do so in the last conflicts, I thought, I haven't heard others say this, and I think it's quite correct. And uh, a lot flows from that. And they are working to have a war machine that is highly effective at destroying its enemies. And uh, they're not just throwing money into the military industrial complex, they're trying to have the money well spent for their, for their empire. And you got into all that, 
And again, I'd like to get more into it and uh, dig into it myself, and I think others do. And uh, as a revolutionary, I share a lot of what you're saying. And I also really, really appreciate your reference to Karl uh, Liebknecht near the end. We have a special responsibility in this country to oppose what our own government is doing in this war. And there has been precious little of this. And when I heard that you were speaking here today, I wanted to be here for that reason. We need to have bust out of the, 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 the deadly science, silence that we have around a monstrous crime that is being hatched here. And I, I, again, I, 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 I'm only going to render less profound what you already said on a lot of these points. But I really think that this needs to be built on and spread both intellectually, politically, and in the streets. I want to point you all to uh, antiwar.com where Ryan had an excellent piece that came out a couple days ago on this matter. And it really, within a tight word limit, he really cogently uh, articulated the nature of the beast. And uh, so for what it's worth, one of the ways we can do that is spread this piece on social media because it's really, it's really, um, it's really excellent. Thank you. Just a, a quick thought on it. You know, the U.S. elite, part of the problem I think they're facing is that, in a sense, they really do believe uh, their own anti-communist propaganda, that any state institution is inherently um, socialist or communist. So it was a big problem, for example, for them in Afghanistan, where they, a big portion of the U.S. elite in their you know, state-building efforts in Afghanistan felt that, felt that if they built proper client state with government departments to regulate business, then that would be socialism. So they had just like the free market reign, which really meant that the CIA and the key producers of heroin, who were also in the sex trafficking reign, ran the country, total black market stuff, including uh, Karzai's half-brother, Ahmed Wali, who ran the country in uh, a lot of the southern Afghanistan. And I mention that because on the one hand, the US capitalists, they have a unified, relatively unified interest to expand the American empire, to grow their market share, but they also have individual interests as a particular company to secure a weapons contract. Like, for example, Lockheed Martin spending, getting huge trillions of dollars for the F-35 was in the interest of the Lockheed Martin capitalists and the bankers who invested it. At the same time, going so far over budget is a big problem because it means that the social surplus that the elite extract from all of our tax dollars and paychecks, and not to mention you know, the capitalist exploitation that's going on, is not being well spent to secure the interests of the empire. And so this contradiction is playing out. And my impression is their levels of, of allowing for such open bribery, such decadence and corruption, have imperiled their empire, in a sense, because it's so much just buying and selling of these contracts regardless if things are ever delivered. Let me give you a different side of it, too, uh, because I think your point's important what you're getting at. The American empire has a real interest. It's not just to blow up other countries for the sake of being bad in a cartoonish way. Of course, there are some cartoonishly villainous people in this country. But when the initial Russian invasion of Ukraine was botched in many respects, the key generals who botched this invasion, or parts of it, were, were fired. Now, I think Russia's still winning the war, but it was demoted. You know, the key people who made certain mistakes, or maybe didn't make mistakes, but took the fall, were demoted. Every single US general who botched every bit of the war in <laughs> Afghanistan and Iraq are, were promoted time and time again. This is a very decadent society we're living in, where the elite kind of rise to their own levels of incompetence. Or so, further. Further, yeah, even higher. You know, um, Only when they have big scandals like with um, uh, what's his name? Uh, who leaked the stuff, gave all the documents to his mistress. Betrayus. Betrayus, yeah. Only then is that seen as too much. But messing up the whole strategy for a major war, eh, good enough. Take a promotion. So, <laughs> uh, next question. Um, Ryan, you, you said briefly that, that you thought that you're not in favor of nations that annex others' territories. And is that, if, am I correct? And can I follow up on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, does, so if, if that's the case, what given, I mean, this was kind of like a chess game that was being played. Yeah. Uh, Putin or Russia would provoke, 
but they were also set up, right, mm -hmm. to be to pay huge prices, like all the sanctions and yeah. so forth. Which, by the way, to me, the economic san the attempt to make the economic sanctions work in some sense against Russia, that's kind of new in the waging of wars. Um, in any case, what would you have suggested, Putin? You know, do you, if you don't support Putin uh, hitting out militarily, what would you have advocated? And if you don't support the annexation, what would have been your uh, path for, you know, what would you have seen as the path he might have followed? Well, I'll answer your question, although it may be a different answer than, than you're expecting. I think the, the problem is this, which is that there's a real, uh, there's a real conflict of interest or a difference, divergence in interests between the interests of the people and the interests of the very powerful countries playing this game. Uh, that's why I said no matter who wins, the people lose. So from the perspective of great power politics, I'm sure Putin could have done more things one way or another. Uh, there's an argument that maybe not invading could have been more effective, although the invasion seems to have been fairly effective so far in securing Russian interests. As I mentioned, the revenues are way up in oil and gas. They are kind of using this to leverage a whole bunch of their influence globally. Uh, key countries like India and Brazil and Mexico, who are part of the US sphere of influence, are more siding with Russia than with the US in some respects on this. But the problem is that we have to see our interests as the people as diverging from these great powers, as fundamentally actually against them. Even if we also oppose, and I think dependable, the, the US provocations here. Um, so that is to say, I think if we see us as primarily rooting for the rivals of the US, then we're still trapped in the same game. We're just rooting for the away team, not the home team. But I think this whole game is rigged against the common people in the US, in Ukraine, in Russia, in China. And, and unless we can find a way out of this mess, then I think it's just going to go from bad to worse, even if a new big bully takes the position of the US as the top dog in the world. Yeah, I, I like the comment that, that my understanding about India's support for Russia relates to the fact that they get all their weapons from Russia. You know, that, that there, are, there are economic uh, and military allegiances there that are difficult for them to break. They get a ton of weaponry from Russia. They get a, a bit from Israel, but the U.S. is trying to, as of uh, late last week, uh, they're working on offering a, I don't remember the amount, but it's basically an economic aid package to India in order to slowly uh, get them to buy more U.S. stuff. And I believe there's a summit coming up. I want to say it's in South Korea. I've been out of the news cycle for the last few days, but I want to say it's in South Korea. And that's where the U.S. is going to formally present this aid package to the Indian government. So we'll see what happens. Could I have one other thing? I, I've been struggling not necessarily with the same analysis, coming from the same analysis as being put forward here. But, you know, I, I operated a bookmobile in New York City. You know, like many people on the left are progressives or pacifists have been trying to do outreach in, within the American culture unsuccessfully, like really terribly unsuccessfully. And that this was a wonderfully complex and, and useful analysis that you presented about both the, the historical background, economic, political background. But from the point of view of the average American that was mentioned before in the comments, this is like way up in the stratus. This is like beyond, beyond. They, they're looking, and of course, American ideology is based upon individual interests and how people are striving to just survive and progress in their own lives, and so, so called for their children. Uh, I'd just like to ask that we consider having further conversation about how can the, uh, how can the propaganda of the culture itself be approached in a more fruitful way. Discussions like this as important as the information you're sharing is and the analysis, this is like magnitudes away from where people are starting at. And to talk about organizing the working class with a rich, this kind of rich intellectual uh, message, I, I think we need to talk more about that question. 
and just keep going across loops. I'm going to go for dawn and then over to next. With, all, with your presentation, I find it hard to believe you don't support what Russia's doing. Because Russia stepped in there days before there was going to be another offensive against the people of Donbass, where 14,000 people were already killed. What was going to stop that? You know, that was the only thing. It was a choice. Do you stop the offensive or not? And they did. And I think that was great. The people of Donbass have been looking for Russian protection since 2014, since the U.S. violent fascist-led coup in 2014, when they outlawed Russian, these people in, in the East said, there's no way we're going to live under this. And they, they, went, they became separatists. And uh, you know, they deserve, they deserve protection. It's that fact alone is the, the reason I definitely support the Russian military action. But I have a few other points I want to mention. You know, most of the world supports Russia and what they're doing. The US and US, Europe, Japan, and Australia are about the only ones that you know, so there's a whole, and this is the U.S. plan for Ukraine, the long war. So you said you, you don't think that the, uh, this, this whole thing is the U.S. plan, so of course it's not a good thing. It's nothing the U.S. has done since World War II is good. This is, this is what the U.S. has in mind. There's a, there's a discussion with McCain and Graham in Ukraine talking to the Nazis, saying this is going to be your time, we're going to go back to Washington. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. and Ian Klobuchar was there too. Yeah, she was there. She didn't say anything though. Yeah. But so, what, what year was that again? That was 2017, the discussion. It, it, you know, it might have been 2015, but he was talking about 2017, so I'm a little confused. Okay. I can send you a link. I have no, I've seen the clip. Yeah, I'd like to see that. that. Okay, I'll send it to you. And then, when, when Zelensky tried to bring the Azov Battalion in, he, this was in 2019. There's a video of him talking to an Azov general, mm -hmm. telling him to like stop their offensive. The Azov general tells him to go fuck himself, yeah. basically. You know, that one too, that's like, that's very clear, like who's in power there. You don't need to, you know, the pre he's telling the president to go, you know, they're not gonna listen to him. And the sanctions, also you mentioned a lot about that, but you didn't mention, you know, that this, uh, Russia produces the majority of the world's fertilizer in Africa, India, and Brazil are gonna be in really bad shape because of that. And other parts of South America, as you mentioned. And unlike the US war efforts, which why you said there were like, uh, they're failing, they're not failing, but they're just going slowly. They're not doing like an air raid in flattening cities. The only, the only time they did a really drastic air raid was in retaliation against the attack inside Russia. When they came back, they did, a little, they did get a little crazy on that. But other than that, they're going slowly, house by house, making sure they don't injure civilians because they want a good relationship when the war is over. Mr. Yes. Jones, do you, have, do you have a question? I, I, yeah, I my question, question. Yeah, I'm getting to oh, why okay. don't you support Russia, but I'm presenting the facts of why. You know, well, let me, let me answer you. Let's say this is a discussion. I, I disagree with you. I'm presenting why I okay. disagree with you. It makes sense. I, I follow what you're saying. Look, breaking down the stuff with the Azov uh, Battalion, the role, what McCain and Graham said. It's very important. People need to know this. The point about fertilizer is key to it. I think McCain mentioned that. Mm -hmm. The thing about it is this, which is that from what I've seen in the situation, in my basic analysis of Russia, the disagreements it's good to talk about is that Russia is an imperialist country, a weak one, not not compared to the, the US, it's very small, but it has definite vested interests in controlling Ukraine. A number of the atrocities and things that they've committed I know have been overblown in the US media. I do think that some of them are, well, are true. Sure was in a Ukrainian, Busha was Ukrainian slaughter. Oh, it's the city of Busha. But hold on, but, you know, but if you look at before this war, what Putin said, he said the Ukrainian nation is, is a fiction created by the Bolsheviks in Lenin. He said um, that they wanted decommunization of Ukraine. We will show them decommunization of Ukraine right. with this war, and the military yeah. operation. It's clearly a very rightist articulation. It wasn't covered in any of the US media. It was a sophisticated rightist articulation. Putin's not a stupid, bloviating idiot like Trump. He, he's articulate. He's very right-wing, openly right-wing. Um, but it, it's clear he, he has a coherent right-wing ideology. Now, hold on, let me come to it. And then if you look at the domestic policies, and it's closely related you know, to what you know, going on in Ukraine, Russia is not, there's a lot of problems in Russia. 
For example, a few years ago, given the promotion of the right wings of the Orthodox Church, Russia decriminalized domestic abuse as long as the husband doesn't kill the wife. That's the sort of policies being promoted domestically. Uh, so I, I think, look, I, I think that Russia was provoked into this war. I think the US uh, provocations towards Russia, the US sanctions, the military buildup, the exercise there are outrageous. But I do think, at the same time, Russia's invasion should be opposed. Ukrainian people will breathe easier after they drive out the US back Nazis. That's all I've got to say. I think the people are going to be better off there than they are now living under a US back Nazi regime. Look, I, oh, okay. Just, so one I, last comment. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I know you talked about this a little bit before and we disagree. I, I think that in any sort of movement, like anti war movement, my hope is that people who have disagreements like this and you know, other things, we can find ways to work together mm -hmm. to stand against the machinations of the war machine. Because we've seen things at times, people turn disagreements into reasons not work together at all. I know that's not what you're promoting, but I'm making a general point for us here and for the audience who's watching. Yeah, great point. No, I just wanted to sort of summarize the whole thing and say that uh, while you bring excellent points to exactly what you know Ryan was saying here, is our job living in the core of the beast, the belly of the beast, is first and foremost to dismantle the horrific military industrial complex. And we can do that in a number of ways, not just working class organizing, but local uh, legislative initiatives because war corporations, while they have captured the federal government, they are less successful at the state and local level. So there's initiatives you can go with uh, banning war profiteering, for example. You can work on divestment campaigns, uh, pulling university um, endowments out of the war machine, out of war corporations, uh, state and pension funds as well. There are some steps. These are these are enormous tasks. I'm not saying this is easy, but our job as working class within the United States is to ally with the workers of the world and to do our part right here by getting rid of the single greatest purveyor of violence in the world, and that is the U.S. military industrial complex. And I'm not saying you're you're wrong on uh, any or more or all of those points, but um, it, yeah, it's important to, for us to keep our eye on the ball. Sir? Oh, I'm not even on, I, I, if we're going across, I just, um, the King didn't call the military industrial complex, the, he said that America as a whole was the greatest yes. purveyor of violence, uh, or the government. And I wonder if, if a lot of industry and a lot of corporations, uh, other than weapons manufacturers, aren't responsible for the rule of neoconsent and the need for the U.S., it's also just our psychology, the need for the U.S. to stay the unipolar power, um, even at the, at the cost of blowing the world up. Anyway, I'm sorry, so just the, the, the corporation and government, when they fuse, aren't just the military industrial complex, but the, the whole array that would like to see the US stay uh, in control of world markets and see the petrodollar remain king. Sure, absolutely, and one of the things that we can do is to get rid of corporate personhood. We're not going to be able to do anything until we reverse all of those um, Supreme Court rulings that have steadily given corporations more power in government and in our society since the 1970s. We, that is first and foremost what we absolutely have to do because until we, uh, if we don't address that, then corporate rule will continue to destroy not just this country, but the world as well. And yeah. Ma'am, I know you've been waiting very patiently to ask your question. I'm sorry. started. 
Absolutely. And just to speak on one of the, the numerous points you raised, because you brought up a lot, you know, the, the promotion of far right forces historically with the US is often tied up with the drug trade, as people are probably aware, some of the stuff in Central and South America. You mentioned Afghanistan. Just to spell out what US intervention in Afghanistan did, before the war in Afghanistan, there was basically no more heroin produced in Afghanistan. Earlier on, had been one of the largest heroin producers in the world in conjunction with the uh, U.S. According to the U.S. own report, Colin Powell actually toured Afghanistan in 2001. There was like very, very small, I think it was like 81 tons of heroin. It's a lot, but compared to what had been there before, it was almost nothing. It had largely been eliminated. By 2006, 90% of the world's heroin was produced in Afghanistan. 100% of the heroin consumed in the United States came from Afghanistan. The CIA worked very closely with the major heroin producers. I mentioned Anand Wali Karzai, who ran Kandahar and most of South Afghanistan until his assassination. Uh, him and others ran the heroin market locally with the CIA. Every time, and you can read about this from McChrystal, Michael Flynn, they tried to investigate Anand Wali Karzai for all the corruption and shady things he was doing because the US military kind of wanted to get rid of him and put someone more pliable in place. The CIA protected him because he was involved in the drug trade. So yeah, you know, the, these far right forces, the drug trade, it, it's very much part of, of, of the whole way that they control other countries and populations. And it goes back, speaking of imperialism and colonialism, to the Opium Wars, for example, where the British and other European powers used the opium trade and mass addiction in opium to subjugate China. And it gives us a lot to think about domestically when the leading cause of death this last year for people under 50 was overdoses. I think it was over 100,000 people under 50 in the United States died from a drug overdose this past year. I mean, it's quite a, a striking thing. And that's why I think in talking about the divergence of our interests with the American corporate elite, the ruling class, we have to see this clearly, that they have no interest in helping us or protecting us. We're increasingly seen by them as a threat. They're criminals. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, unless there's any other thing, I have a little bit of a small announcement to make. Um, just, uh, first thing, I'm, I, my name's Abby. I had the privilege of helping a little bit with this event, and particular with just a really good group kind of came together under the umbrella of United Against War and Militarism, and um, this was an idea of intervention in, in the larger situation, how to really break out of the lack of a, a clear analysis. And when we started talking about this about a month or two, there was a hope, I think there would be more of a groundswell of opposition to the, the rush for NATO support. And we haven't seen that. But so that's where we are. So we have to go forward from there and, and build on what the, what's there. And I think this conversation was today was a good sign and a good step in that direction. If you haven't, there's a, a pamphlet that was put together pretty recently by our group, just putting a few points forward. Please read it, critique it, be in touch about it. And um, in New York City in particular, there's kind of a small group here, but in, in the good part about this group, you know, against war militarism, is there's been a lot of campuses, well, a handful of them in different parts of the country, coming together and protesting regularly over the last few months, both against this escalation, but against the military contractors in general. And so there are signs that things are, are starting to come together, not just with that effort, but it's one part of, I think, a growing consciousness, a lot smaller than we needed to see at this country, but there's a lot to build on. And I'm tremendously grateful for Christian for coming all the way down here for this trip. Um, I hope we can all in this room talk more after this too, if we have time. 
But um, one last thing is, it was just a few people putting this together, and there is a, a significant charge for the room. If people had a few extra bucks to contribute to defray those expenses, I think there's a jar in the front. I think if people, if within their means, if you had five or ten even, that would be very helpful for us. But, um, you know, if not, sliding scale, don't worry. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being here, and, and Ryan and Christian for your amazing presentations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.